my God, my God, my God, he is mighty to save. There's nothing going on in your life that God doesn't have the power to reach in and snatch you out of it, be it physically, emotional, financial, in every area of your life. He is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Welcome back into this moment of service where we prepare our hearts to lay out the tablecloth and bring the knife and spoon and fork and get ready, get the plate ready to receive the word of the Lord. That we might grow, that we might be strengthened, that we might be edified by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And I'm excited about the word that he's given us today. I'm so excited about it that I want to encourage you to reach out to your friends right quick, text them right quick, and let them know, do whatever you need to do to get in touch with them, share this moment, this opportunity that they might be brought into what God is about to say because it's going to bring peace. It's going to bring healing and fortification to you. So grab your Bible right fast and go to the Gospel of St. John chapter 1, verse 19 through 33. And there you will experience the Word of God in all of its might and all of its clarity. Again, it's John 1, chapter 19, verse 33, and it reads thusly. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then, art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What saith thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. And as said the prophet Esaias, and they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? Jesus, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who cometh after me is preferred before me whose shoes latched I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Spirit of the living God, fall freshly upon us as we embark upon the mission of unveiling the mysteries of your word. Speak in such a profound and didactic way that we are altered and irrevocably changed by the presence and power of, of the one with whom we have to do. I thank you in advance for what you are about to do because you have all power in your hand. Have your way amongst your people and I trust you to do all things well because you are God. <laughs> and besides you, there is no other, there are no competitors. There is no rivalry. You stand in a category all by yourself. Speak, Lord, for thy servant hears. In Jesus' mighty and righteous name we pray. Every believer everywhere ought to shout amen. I want to use a subject this morning for the text, Know Your Role. Uh-huh, yeah. 
to know your role. I want to take a moment and set the text in context by understanding that we have just read to you out of the Gospel of St. John. The Gospel of St. John is not one of the synoptic Gospels as Matthew, Mark, and Luke is. It stands in a category all by itself. It is uniquely tabulated and formulated and has a different perspective for us. It reads almost like a series of short stories unveiling one right after the other without the bother of continuity from day to day. It just moves us along in a methodical method toward a conclusion that exemplifies Christ with a different perspective and a different clarity from any of the other writers. It stands in a class all by itself largely and completely because John himself is quite different. He, he introduces the book, not from the perspective of proving the authenticity of Jesus' right to be the Messiah from the perspective of the lineage he has on his mother's side and father's side, as Matthew, Mark, and Luke would do. But no, he traces it all the way back to the beginning and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He's going right back to the spirit of who Jesus is, and not the flesh of who Jesus is. He goes back to the Ruah, to the breath, to the God Himself, to the Creator of the universe. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. He shows us the deity of Jesus Christ, and the Word was made flesh. John 1, 14, and dwelt among us, and we beheld the wonder, the wonder of his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is John. This is John, and in the process of him delivering this, 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 this liturgy, as it were, in the process of him establishing this, this document of authenticity, this deed, this divine deed of trust, in the process of him unveiling the substantive origin of who Jesus is from a heavenly perspective, in the middle of it, he mentions uh, his own journey. Now, you must understand that when John mentions John the Baptist, you've got John talking about John. And I want to start with John talking about John. He mentions John the Baptist, but he is not John the Baptist. This is John the Evangelist or Saint John. This is John the Apostle. He is one of the 12. He is not John the Baptist. This is John the one who laid his head on Jesus' breast. This is John the one who sat with Jesus. This is John the one that made up the inner circle with Jesus. This is John the one that was in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. This is John, the one that was at the, at, the, at the table at the Last Supper with Jesus, described in this book alone as the one whom Jesus loved. Neither Matthew, Mark, nor Luke describe him as the one whom Jesus loved, but John describes himself as the one whom Jesus loves. It's odd to me that he says that. He doesn't say the one who loves Jesus. He says, I am the one whom Jesus loves, as if he knows that he has a favor on his life. And perhaps that favor is exemplified in the fact that he has always been in the inner circle He's always been in the right place. He's always been in the great crowd. He's always been there on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's always been there in moments of power in the inner circle with Jesus Christ. At the Last Supper with his head upon his breast, after the resurrection, it is John that identifies Jesus on the shore. He knows Jesus. He knows Jesus as if he knows him in a way that none of the other disciples seem to be able to declare him or understand him to the degree that John knows Jesus. He is the one whom Jesus loved. We know that, that there must be some validity to how he describes himself because Jesus rebuked the other disciples and said, if I leave him here until I come, what is that to do with you? Jesus defended him. And we know that he had a favor on his life because John outlived all the rest of the apostles. We know that he had an anointing on his life because he is credited for writing at least two books, the one we're reading from and the book of Revelations. We know that he had the favor of God on his life 
because Jesus comes back and unveils the apocalypse called the book of Revelations to him and he pins it. He has an inside track on who Jesus is and what Jesus wants and how Jesus moves and how Jesus loves. It must be an amazing thing to describe yourself as the one whom Jesus loved. Can you imagine? Hello, I'm Bishop Jenks. I'm the one whom Jesus loved. And who are you? <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm the one whom Jesus loves. That's, that's, that's how I identify myself. That's how I understand myself. That's how I realize my relationship with him is that I am a recipient of his love. It's not about me loving him because that's flaky and sometimes and spasmodic and sometimes inconsistent, but I am a recipient of a constant beam of light of love that shines down on me even into the darkest hour of the night. You may not see it, but it yet glares upon me because the love of God is that consistent. It is not spasmodic. It is not erratic. It is not temporal. It is not sometimey. It is consistent. I am always the one whom Jesus loves. He outlives everybody. This is the last testimony of Jesus Christ in the earth. It's given at the pen of John, the apostle, one of the twelve. And he writes to us in a powerful and profound way. And we are able to hear insights about Jesus that we would not otherwise hear. He declares in his writings the I am's over and over again declaring the I am's. There are seven times that he says, he describes him as the seven I am's in the gospel of St. John. The Christology that he brings to us is amazing. It depicts Jesus as divine, as, as preexistent, and identifies him with the one God, and besides him there is no other. He's in a category all by himself. He says to us over and over, I am, I am, I am, I am. It reminds me of what God told Moses, I am that I am. John knows him as the I am that Moses saw him as in the burning bush. He describes him as, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate of the sheep. He describes him understanding, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. He clearly understands in seven powerful ways the I amness of God. That's who's writing to us today. That's who's talking to us today. That's who's ministering to us today, the one whom Jesus loved. Good God Almighty, the one. If he don't love anybody else, he loves me. I'm the one whom Jesus loved. The, the confidence that he has reminds me of a well-loved child. You know, when a child is well-loved and knows that they are well-loved, there is a confidence that they have that, that gives them the ability to walk into the room and fill the room because they are sure of themselves. When you are not sure of yourself, you are always measuring yourself by other people's standards. When you are not sure of yourself, you are uncertain of your accomplishments, and it's not, it's, it's not your fault. We live in a world that constantly, over and over again, teaches us to compare ourselves with other people. The first runner-up in the beauty pageant, the second runner-up in the beauty pageant. We've watched it all our lives. The Olympic award winner is, and the nominee is, over and over again, we are taught to be competitive, and we live in a competitive environment of, am I the GOAT? the greatest of all times, sets me apart from all other people. Everybody's fighting to be better. We're constantly measured and timed and compared over and over again, trying to understand ourselves by ourselves, comparing ourselves with ourselves. In so doing, it is not wise. It's a terrible thing to compare yourself. It's not wise to compare yourself. It leads to frustration and inner turmoil when you compare yourself and a feeling of unworthiness. And when you do feel worthy, it only lasts for a short time because there's always somebody who comes along who has attributes that you don't have. 
And I want to talk to somebody today who has constantly been miserable and insecure and uncertain about who you are and you don't know your place and you don't know your status and you don't know your role and you're always shifting and you're always wavering and you're always uncertain, often envious, often jealous, often unsure because you don't know who you are. You don't know your role. You don't know your role. And you can't be happy within yourself until you know your role. Because if you don't know your role, you're only good till somebody better comes along. And when somebody better comes along, you're intimidated. When you're intimidated, you become aggravated. When you become aggravated, you frustrate your environment because you don't know your role. You don't know, well, I'm the one who Jesus, you don't know where you fit, who you are, where you stand. And so the only way you can evaluate your worth and you've been miserable and you've been successfully miserable, successfully miserable, you've been successful and still miserable because every time you have an accomplishment, you see somebody who's got something else and you say, well, I don't have that. If I could only have that, if I could only have this acknowledgement, when are they going to recognize me? When are they going to? And you're frustrated on the inside because you don't know your own. John knew who he was. I am the one whom Jesus loved. Don't pay no attention to the other 12. I'm the one whom Jesus loved. And yes, there are three other guys in the inner circle, but I am the one whom Jesus loved. Peter, James, and John showed up everywhere, but John clearly knew who he was. He knew his role. I am the one whom Jesus loved. You don't see him comparing himself with Peter. Why am I not preaching? on the day of Pentecost. Why, why, why am I not doing it? Why am I not doing this? Why am I not walking on water? Why? No, he knows who he is. He's comfortable on the boat while Peter is walking on the water trying to prove something. John is laid back on the boat because he knows that pretty soon Jesus is going to get to him. He knows if I stay where I'm at, Jesus is going to come to me. Why? Because I am the one whom Jesus loved. And I don't have to perform for anybody. And I don't have to impress anybody. And I don't have to be spectacular because I know my role. And when you know your role, you're not afraid to be around other great people because you're not constantly tormented by their greatness. I want to talk to somebody this morning who is constantly tormented by the greatness of other people. Tormented by, frustrated, comparing yourself, measuring yourself. Am I enough? Do I have what you have? Mine didn't look like yours. They put more on your plate than they put on my plate. You hit a note I didn't hit. They call on you more than they do. Stop! You can never be proficient in the kingdom of God until you know your role. And the role God has given you is commensurate with the gifts he's placed inside of you. You don't want to be like a Eddie Murphy movie where you're playing four roles in the movie. You don't want to be like one of the Tyler Perry movies where you're playing in every role. You want to be confident to know who you are and where you stand. And I suspect that part of it comes from knowing that John starts out talking about who God is. And sometimes knowing who God is helps you to know who you are. Since God is a script writer and he gave you your lines, the only thing you have to do is know your role. In the beginning, what's the word? In the beginning, what's the script? In the beginning, what's the word? In the beginning, what's the script? In the beginning, what's the word? And the word was with God. And the word was God. All things were made by him. Everything lined up the way he planned for it to be directed. He gave me everything I needed to be who I am and nothing that I needed to be who you are. I am fully equipped and totally loaded to perform the function I was created to do, and I cannot compare myself with Peter or James or Bartholomew or anybody else. I'm in a class all by myself. I am, I am, I am like he is. I am the one who the I am loves. If you could bring yourself to think like that, the torment would be over. I want to go deeper because there are a lot of things that you think that the devil is doing to you that it is not the devil at all. 
It is self-mutilation. It is self-mutilation. Your discontentment, your frustration, your pain, your turmoil, your inability to hold relationships and keep people together, your inability to sustain love is self-mutilation. Those people who are hating on you are a reflection of you hating on you. Because you have never been content with your own role. And when and until you learn to be happy with what God gave you, you'll always be miserable. And you don't need a devil to be miserable. Satan wouldn't waste a demon on you. For him to send a demon to torment you would be a waste of resources. Because he knows left to yourself, you will always doubt yourself and forfeit what you have. Because my brothers and sisters, you don't know your role. You must understand me that when, when it comes to knowing your role, it's not just important for disciples or preachers or leaders or thinkers or, or business leaders or fathers or mothers or wives or husbands. And when it comes to knowing your role, it's important even for animals. Even all fowl are not the same. All, 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 all reptiles are not the same. All four-footed beasts are not the same. Not all mammals are not the same. All fish are not the same. And peace comes in knowing Knowing who you are, knowing how you're created, and being willing to be yourself. If you're a bird, be a bird. Be a bird. You don't see birds saying, pray for me that I might fly better. Pray for me that I might do this better. Pray for me that I have more feathers. Because they know that they're not all, they're, they're not created the same because all of them have something, but none of them have the same thing. And you ought to at least be smart. Take the chicken, for instance. The, 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 the chicken is happy to be a chicken with its short little wings and its big fat body and its skinny little legs. They don't need therapists. They don't need counseling. They don't, need, they don't have emotional disorders. They don't have breakdowns. They don't cry. They walk around on them little bitty legs as happy as they can be. They jump and fly about three, four, five feet into the air, fall back down to the ground again. They know who they are. They're in a class all by themselves. You don't see any, any, any other bird any more popular on the cuisine, on the, on the restaurant list, on the table list, in the chicken, is in a class all by himself. In demand all over the world, from Japan to Jamaica, the chicken is in demand. He is always in demand, but he is nothing like anybody else. He's not like the eagle, for example. The eagle who is majestic and powerful and spreads his wings, the eagle's wings have a nine foot span from tip to tip. He's able to spread his wings as if he is a God made jet. He flies faster than any bird. He goes higher than the chicken would ever go. His eyesight is so keen that he can see miles away in the storm and in the dark, and he functions on another level. He, they mate in the air. They give birth. They, they make love in the air. They lay their eggs in the high places. Eagles are to the, the fowl kingdom what a lion is to the jungle. They are the masters of where they are. But they're happy to be eagles. They're not trying to be chickens. They're not trying to be an hors d'oeuvre. They're not trying to be filleted. They're not trying to be sauteed. They'll never be on a menu. They'll never be raised up to be eaten because though they can fly, they are not tasty. They got something, but they didn't get everything. And as long and as bright and as brilliant as the eagle's wings are and as high as he can fly, his beauty cannot be compared to the peacock who spreads its wings in the middle of mating to attract its mates to show how beautiful its feathers is. Its back is straight, its head, its head is held up high. It may not fly like the eagle, and it may not taste like the chicken, but it has amazing wings. 
and each of them, though they are the same species, they were created to play a different role. All of them have attributes and liabilities, but they know who they are and they are happy to play their role. Lord, wouldn't it be amazing to be in a church where people knew their abilities and knew their limitations and they were happy to be who they were. I would love to work in a place where everybody knew their abilities and they knew their limitations and they were happy to play their role. I would love to be in a family where everybody knew their abilities and they knew their limitations and they were happy to play their role, not comparing themselves. You gave him a bigger bicycle than you gave me. You did this better. No, 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 no. See, peace comes from knowing comes from understanding that every one of these has its own kind of beauty and its own kind of purpose and its own kind of limitations and it will all work out fine if you don't try to be like the eagle. Everything will be all right. And if you don't come down to the chicken coop, everything will be fine. And if you don't use those beautiful wings you have to try to climb to the top of a mountain and soar, you will remain beautiful. But if you go to the cliff top with them beautiful wings, they will not support you. You must know your role. I want to talk to you this morning because the Holy Spirit said to me that there are some of you who do not know your role. And he said, God, I want to know my purpose. I want to know my role. I want to know what I'm supposed to do. I want to know where I am. I want to know this. You want all the information. You don't need information. You need understanding. You need an understanding that you are not a mistake. That you are not an accident. That you are not an afterthought. That you are not a mishap. That you are not a failure. You need to understand that you got short wings for a reason. You need to understand that you're not supposed to fly like the eagle. You need to understand that God didn't make a mistake when he made you. You have to understand who you are so that you can interact with other people on other levels and know who you are because you know your role. You can't produce a film if, if the supporting actor is trying to compete with the leading actor. You signed up to be a supporting actor. Now be happy to be a supporting actor. Don't get in the middle of the movie and start trying to steal the lines from the lead role because that's not who you are in the movie. Can I get after this? Because I want to get after this because I'm tired. I'm tired of shouting saints who get happy but ain't happy. Who dance but have no joy. Who clap but have no peace. Who shout but have no power. And the reason you don't have any power is that you have never learned how to maximize your potential on your level. God didn't promise to give us all the same stuff. Some he'll give 30, and some he'll give 60, and some he'll give a hundredfold. And to one man he gave one talent, and to another one he gave two, and to another one he gave five. God did not prepare, did not say that he would equip us all the same. He says to us, I gave you what I gave you, and the only thing you have to give and account for is what the lines I gave you and the script I've read to you, and the only thing I'm asking you to do is play your role. Good God Almighty, I'm going to help somebody today. I can feel it. I'm not asking you to play somebody else's role. I'm not asking you to work with the gift I didn't give you. The only thing I ask of you is to know your role and play your role and be confident to play the role that God has given you and to know that that is what this is all about. Bishop, I hear you, and you're talking to me, and you're making great sense, but I want to know, I want to know how does this all tie up together. I'm so glad you asked because you won't really understand why I'm preaching this text because I've only talked to you about the first John. I'm talking to you about John, the Gospel of St. John, the Apostle John, the Disciple John, the one who laid on Jesus' breast, I've been talking to you about him, but he talks to you about John the Baptist. And you won't understand the power of this text until I tell you why in the first chapter of the Gospel of St. John that John the writer 
talks about John the Baptist. There are two different Johns. John the writer is the sons, is one of the sons of Zebedee, described as the son of thunder. His mother Simone is said to be the sister of Mary, and John the writer is said to be a cousin of Jesus. And now we understand why he lays on Jesus' breast, because he was a young protege, younger than Peter and the rest of them. That's why he outran them when they went to the empty tomb, because he was young when they were getting older. That's why he outlived them and ends up out on Patmos writing and dies of old age and is not martyred the way the rest of them were because we're talking about John the writer. But John the writer immediately in the first chapter introduces us to John the Baptist. What was it about John the Baptist that made John the writer write about John the Baptist? Can I have some time with this? You see, John the Baptist is the one that introduced John the writer to Jesus. See, John, the Saint John, the writer who wrote the book, started out not as a disciple of Jesus Christ. He was a disciple of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was his first pastor. And he writes to us about the experience and the lesson he learned from his first pastor, John the Baptist. Wild locusts and honey eating John the Baptist. John the Baptist with the funny clothes. John the Baptist who ministered in the wilderness. John the Baptist who broke the protocol and was not like his father. He did not serve in the temple, but he preached in the wilderness. John the Baptist who was confident in his own skin. John the Baptist who had his own name set apart from all of his kindred. And none of his kindred had been called by his name. John the Baptist, his first pastor, knew he, who he was. He says, I am not Elias. I am not Isaiah. I am not the Messiah. I am a voice. I am. The I am's keep going on and on. I am a voice crying in the wilderness. And John writes to us about his first pastor, John the Baptist. And theologians agree that it was John who, John and Andrew, who were introduced to Jesus when John the Baptist was baptizing in the Jordan and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that it was in fact this experience that caused them to follow Jesus. You will remember the text, they heard John, but they followed Jesus. That, 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 is, that is something you need to understand. When the gospel is best applied, they need to hear you, but follow Jesus. They need to hear you, but follow Jesus. They don't hear you and follow you, they hear you and follow Jesus. They heard John, they followed Jesus. That text is referring to John and Andrew. They heard John, but they followed Jesus. And in John chapter 1, verse 35 through 39, we begin to understand that John the Baptist pointed out Jesus at the expense of losing some of his own disciples. And he was confident enough to be willing to suffer loss because he knew his role. <laughs> Good God of mercy. See, the problem in your office is do you know your role? Did they ask you to comment on that? Did they ask you to fix that? Did they ask you? The problem in most of our relationships is that people do not know their role. John knew his role. He said, I indeed baptize you with water, but there is one coming after me who is mightier than I. And that's where most of us lose it. We're cool until somebody mightier comes. We're happy until somebody prettier comes. We're great until somebody smarter comes. We're satisfied until somebody more anointed comes. And then we become all frustrated and we stop being us, trying to be them because we are comparing ourselves with other people rather than to be satisfied to be who they are. But John said, no! 
You're not going to make me say I'm Esaias, and you're not going to make me play like I'm Isaiah, and you're not going to trick me into trying to be the Messiah. I am not the one. I am the forerunner of the one, and there is one coming after me who is mightier than I, and I'm cool with it. There's one coming after me who's prettier than I, and I'm cool with it. There's one coming after me who is more intellectual than I, and I'm cool with it. And no, your role is all about being comfortable in your own skin and to be happy to know who you are. Can I go deeper with this thing? When I came to this church and I started pastoring, we were in magazines everywhere. By the year 2000, we were in magazines everywhere, deemed as the fastest growing church in America. People were coming in in busloads to see our facilities. They called it the smart church. We were the fastest growing church in America. Everybody in Texas was talking about it. Everybody around the world was talking about it until Daddy Osteen died and Joel started pastoring and he built that stadium and filled it up and the cameras all turned and went to Houston and they got the title I had, the fastest growing church in America. And you know what? I was cool with it. <laughs> I was comfortable with it. I'm still cool with it because there's always somebody coming along that's going to do greater. And you got to be happy to do you until you learn to be happy with the gifts that God gave you, you'll never be strong enough to introduce somebody greater than you. You'll never be strong enough to walk into a mighty room and be comfortable enough not to be competitive. You'll never be strong enough to stop being envious of everybody else. John said, the one coming after me is mightier than I and I'm cool with it because I know my role. I am excellent at preparing the way for what's next. And John the Baptist was so self-assured that John, St. John, wrote about him in his opening chapter because John the Baptist knew how to play his role. He said, you see him, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He said, this is the guy right here. This is the guy right here. What's coming after me, he's mightier than me. I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes, and I'm cool with it. I'm happy to be me. I'm happy to be me. I'm happy to be me. You'll never find fulfillment until you learn to walk into the joy of how you are created. Even if you quack like a chicken, you got to learn how to walk around in the barnyard and quack and crow and make your noises and be happy to understand I'm doing what I was created to do. If you spread your wings like the eagle and soar in the air while the wind is up under your wings, you can't be looking down at the chicken saying, they want their eggs more than they want mine. Or even if you walk around in the forest occasionally spreading your wings like the peacock and catching the attention of people even though you don't fly at all, you know who you are. John the Baptist knew who he was. He knew who he was. He was happy to be who he was. He said, I am a voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. I'm just a voice. My name's not important. My degrees are not important. My background is not important. My pedigree is not important. I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Greater is coming and I'm cool with it. Bigger is coming and I'm cool with it. More is coming and I'm cool with it. I'm not going to compete with your calling or your gifting. I'm happy to be who I am. Hallelujah. And here's my final statement. John, who seems so humble and knows his role 
And it's so cool to be in this role. And says, there's one coming after me who is mightier than I. He's talking about Jesus. Not long after he introduces Jesus, he has fulfilled his purpose and he dies because he has done what he was created to do. That's why you die, because I have done what I was created to do. And when he had done it, he died. And the guy who was greater, Jesus, is now preaching the eulogy of John the Baptist. And Jesus is the one that John the Baptist said was greater. But when Jesus preaches John the Baptist's funeral, he said, there is none greater. <laughs> there is none greater amongst all the prophets than John the Baptist. None! How can Jesus say that there is none greater than John the Baptist? John never wrote a book of the Bible. John never performed a miracle. John never stopped the Red Sea. John never was neither a major nor minor prophet. He was just a voice crying in the wilderness. But Jesus says there is none greater than John the Baptist. What made John the Baptist greater is because John the Baptist knew his role. And I want to pray for you because the Lord said to me that if I would preach this message, he would minister to people who have been tormented by the success and accomplishments of other people, comparing themselves with other people. You have missed great moments of joy and peace and contentment because you're not happy to be the rooster you want to be, the eagle. Or you're not happy to be the eagle you want to be, the peacock. And as long as you torment yourself, Satan won't even waste the devil on you because you are your own worst enemy because you don't know your role. And I want to challenge you today that today we break the curse. Today we break the stone. Today we break through the struggle that has tormented you all of your life. Today we break all the things that were said to you that compared you with your sister and compared you with your brother and made you always feel less than. You've always been fighting from a disadvantage because you were cursed as a child to feel insecure and inferior. And the Lord sent this word to you to break through all those other words that have ever been said about you. God said you're not a failure. You're not a mistake. You're not a mishap. You're not a less than. You were created for a divine purpose and everything you need to fulfill that purpose you have. So stop praying for bigger wings because he didn't mean for you to fly. And stop praying, eagle, for more colors because where you are in height, nobody could see them anyway. You have to understand why God gave you what he gave you. And to just know your role. Jesus says there's none greater than John the Baptist because rarely in this life do you run into anybody that has the confidence and the self-esteem to just know your role and to be happy to be what God created you to be. As I close today, I want to pray for secret torment. I don't want to pray for the 8 o'clock in the morning you. I want to pray for the 1.30 a.m. you that lays in the bed at night wondering, am I enough? I want to pray for the scared you and the worried you and the tormented you that keeps looking at other people's feathers. God said it stops today. God said today is the day 
that you step into the fullness of who you were created to be and you simply know your role. And you are happy. If you're a background singer, you're a bad background singer. If you're a lead singer, you're happy to be a lead singer, but you're not trying to be a worship leader. If you're a worship leader, you're not trying to lead the solo in the choir because you know your gifting and you know what God has given you. And for once in your life, you're 50 years old and for once in your life, God wants you to be happy, to be you, and to be the woman and the man or the preacher or the teacher or the son that God created you to be without measuring your feathers against your brothers. You have to do what God put you in the earth to do and let somebody else come along and let greater come all it wants to because you cannot beat me. Nobody, hear me good, nobody can beat me being me. There will never ever be another me. I am the one. I am the one. I am the one whom Jesus loved. And so, ah, you. Little feathers and all. Pretty wings, but I can't fly and all. <laughs> Broken feathers and skinny legs and all. Are you not the one whom Jesus loved? Then why aren't you happy? Why are you not living your life to the fullest? Why are you so easily intimidated and tormented, measuring your feathers will drive you crazy. And the Lord said in the middle of this pandemic, while we have time for self-evaluation and introspection, that God wants this to be a healing moment in your life. God wants to break your ruler your yardstick and stop you from measuring feathers with whoever is coming along next. And God will put you in the company of great men if it doesn't make you feel small. And God will open great doors for you if you stop feeling small when he opens them. And God will bring you before kings and princes if you'll be comfortable to play your role in the palace, even if you're just a cupbearer, Nehemiah, you made it to the kingdom. You gotta get better at being you. If this message spoke to you, if it got behind your church mass for a moment, if it explained what was going on in your house, in your childhood, if it opened up some issues and some areas in your life where you have secretly felt deficient and medicated your pain through any kind of abuse or sex or drugs or anything you could take to make you feel prettier, cuter, better, more necessary, needed, important, all of the things you've been doing to fill in the gaps of your little short wings, you won't need them anymore because today God wants you to be happy to be who he created you to be and to know your role. Now you can get better at it. I'm not saying don't have aspirations. You can be the best chicken. You can be the best eagle. <laughs> Glory to God. 
You can be the finest peacock, but you cannot be something you were not created to be. And you got to get better at being you. And as I close today, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you like a father prays for a child. A child, he understands their brokenness. I want to pray for you. I want to wipe those tears back out of your face. And I want to talk to the scared you that always feels like you're not enough. That's not true. You're everything you were created to be. You will go as far as he means for you to go, and you will do everything he meant for you to do. And you will work on you, and you will improve you, and you will enhance you, and you will grow you. But you must be you. And God wants you to be glad about it. Because heaven told me that sometimes you don't appreciate what he gave you. You only appreciate what he gave somebody else. And God is tired of you praising him out of your lips, but your heart is not thankful for what he gave you. You say the right stuff. You shout the right way. But in your heart, you're resentful that your feathers are not brighter and that your wings don't extend further. And you've cursed the coop that God placed you in. And you need to go to God right now and say, God, I'm so sorry because I did not really appreciate that you love me with my little wings. <laughs> And you love me with my colorful wings, even though they can't fly. And you love me with these big old wings that can fly real good, but they sure are ugly. You love me like I am, and I have got to get better at agreeing with you where I can walk up to somebody and say, Hi, I'm the one whom Jesus loved. <laughs> see my feathers, see my skinny legs, see my knobby knees, he loved them. He love them just like that. Don't change them. He love my skinny legs. Do you get it? I want to pray with you right now. If you have the courage to strip off your church face and let me have a moment of prayer with the part of you that's restless and frustrated and nothing is ever enough, nothing is enough, nothing is enough, nothing is enough, nothing is enough because inside, you don't appreciate how you were created. You've insulted the creator. You are fearfully and marvelously made. You just don't know it. Jesus said there's none greater than John the Baptist because John was cool with it. <laughs> use me the way you're supposed to use me and then let the next guy go to the next level, I'm cool with it. I won't compete with what I ought to be cool with. Father, I tried to tell them what you told me. I hope you're pleased. I tried to deliver to them what you delivered to me. I hope they got it. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that a deep piercing anointing would flow through this message, that it would convict who needs to be convicted, that it would convert who needs to be converted, that it would challenge who needs to be challenged, that it would correct who needs to be corrected until we all become confident in that we are the one whom you loved and we will not despise how we are created, but we will appreciate that this is the Lord's doings and it's marvelous in his eyes. I want you to say that this is the Lord's doings 
and it's marvelous in his eyes. Now I want you to let it be marvelous in your eyes. And if that happens, this moment we set apart from all other moments. This is a moment unlike any other moment you ever had. You've been delivered from drugs, you've been delivered from alcohol, you've been delivered from sex, you've been delivered from people, but you have never been delivered from you. Today, God said, I will deliver you from yourself. This is the last time you cut on you. This is the last time you think down on you. This is the last time you wish you had somebody else's lines in the movie. Because this is the first time that you know your role. If you got a release through this message, I want to challenge you to sow any kind of seed the Holy Spirit says, say, just, just as, a, as an act of acknowledgement, any kind of seed. If God was talking to you or about your marriage or about your work life or about your spiritual life or about what's going on in your head, if you heard him, I don't care if it's $10. I don't care if it's $20. I don't care if it's $5.99. I want you to send an indication to heaven. I know you talking to me, Jesus. And I heard you. And I'm going to listen to this message again and again and again until I steal it from T.D. Jakes. I'm going to get it in my head and in my spirit until I can preach it on my couch. Because ain't nobody ever talked to me about me. They talk to me about everything else. But nobody ever helped me with me. And I gotta live with me. And I'm tired of tormenting me while I'm living with me. I now know my role. If it spoke to you. Father, I pray that every seed sown, every gift given, every acknowledgement made. You said we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. I pray that it would go up before you as a testimony that God, I heard you. I heard you. Nobody ever talked to me about that before. I heard you. Nobody ever challenged the way I evaluate me or the way I secretly look over my glasses at other people and their greatness makes me feel smaller. Thank you for getting in my business. And I pray God that they would walk in a healing and a wholeness that's different from anything they ever got out of any other service ever before because this day they were challenged in the secret places and the recesses of their own understanding of self-worth. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Text everybody you know. Tell everybody you know. Talk to everybody you know. Tell them. If you don't know calculus, if you don't know geometry, if you don't know technology, if you don't know science, if you don't know history, if you don't know anything else, if you don't know what the future holds for the country, or whether the church is going to open back up, or whether the wind is going to blow north to south, if you don't know anything else, you know your role. I bless you.